we're going to finish up on the critical spirit today. Um, so, you know, the first, the first couple of segments, the first segment we talked about the critical spirit in ourselves, right? We talked about um, where the origin of the critical spirit, how we deal with it, how it affects us, right? And then the second part, we talked about what? How the critical spirit affects our relationships. Does that make sense? And so today we're going to talk about our, how it affects our relationship with God. And where this is coming from, we, we know in the gospel that Jesus told us the greatest commandments were word, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbors, love yourself. So we have to learn to love God, we have to love, learn to love others, and then love ourselves. And so that's where this teaching is, is sourcing from. Does that make sense? Okay, y'all stand with me. I need y'all focused. <laughs> this is important. I want y'all to win at everything because you're supposed to. You tell me when Jesus lost. Okay, right? Hey, Sue. Right? That makes sense? So that's the life that's inside of you guys. And so these things I'm teaching you guys is to help you understand and unlock and, and, and get in tune with the nature that's in you. Does that make sense? And that's why, you know, yeah, I know the teach go over an hour. I know, you know, listen, it's so important. It's so important, you know? Okay? All right, so bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and Lord, I thank you for each, each and every person who's here, God, and who's watching online, Father. Father, I just pray that I'm being obedient to what you called me to do in teaching and educating your people on the critical spirit, Father God. And Father, I pray that as we go into this, this message, God, that your people, um, minds and hearts are receptive and open. And that, Lord, that you just continue to bring more revelation, more clarity, and help us all grow into the maturity and the nature and stature of Christ, God. And so, God, I'm so excited uh, just about the fruit that we're all going to bear, God, from these revelations, God. So, God, I bless your people, Father. Father, I just yield myself completely to you, God. Whatever you want to do today, Father. Uh, Father, we yield ourselves to you, God. And, God, we thank you, Father. We bless you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Have a seat. Have a seat. <laughs> so, okay. So, Talking about our relationship with God, I, I want to I start this way, ask you guys some questions. And for you guys who are new here, we, we teach open discussion so people can, can talk back to me, okay? Is that okay, Joy? Now, don't, don't you do the talk back, Andrew, that you normally do. I mean, feedback, not, not, cr not critical talk back. Okay? <laughs> you know, because when people find out, you know, that I'm a prophet, they have their own mindset about what they think a prophet is, right? And they, they're like, oh, okay, well, that means that if I'm thinking something, you're going to know. If I, like, they think about, like, psychics and things of that nature, right? And, uh, and I like to educate people on the, bibli the biblical Holy Spirit, true revelation about callings and gifts and callings. Okay, so when it comes to God, we, 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 add, we have questions for God, but we also question God, right? Who finds himself having questions or questioning God sometimes? Everybody? And see, and, and, and as a prophet, that's a lot of what I get a lot of times. A lot of times it's just people come to me with, sometimes they know the answer, but they just want to be sure that they're 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 sure, more sure, right? That they are hearing or getting or why this or why this or why that, right? And we're like a physical point of contact between man and God, right? In addition to, of course, having Jesus. So what are some of the most common questions or questions that we have for God. What 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 are some what are some of the things that we question about God? Our calling. Okay. What else? Why is this happening to me? What else? Are we on the right path? What else? What should I do? What else? Why haven't I been healed? Okay. What? Is it for real? Is that you, Frederico? Spotlight my eyes. Yeah, I see you back there. Okay, what else? Are you there? Okay, come on, talk to me, guys. I mean, y'all sitting there acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Are you mad at me? What else are we thinking? Why, why are they doing that? Oh, yeah, we do tell God that. Why do bad things happen to good people? What else? Why are you allowing this situation? You got that allowing. She's like, <laughs> why are you allowing this situation to happen? Okay. What, what? What What do you give your money to? I can answer that. You bring it on down here. You know, just joking. I'm just, don't y'all get crazy on me. You know. <laughs> okay, Tara, what do you have? 
Okay, you feel like sometimes God's told you something, but you don't see it. So then what's the question? I don't see it, God. Okay, good. What do you, what do you got, Thelma? How long, God? How long? What do you say, woman of God? Did you really say that? That's good. That's good. Anything else? Do you see this? <laughs> do you see what pastor's doing? He's late. Well, yeah, Mike. Just agree? Oh, your, your, your husband over there confirming, you know, what you're saying. Anything else? Is this God or is the devil? Okay, that's good. Good. Is this God or is this me? Okay. Anything else? Jim, what you got, Jim? I know you got something, Jim. You <laughs> Diplomatic group. He's a diplomatic group. I agree with everyone. I agree with everyone. What do you mean? I don't understand, right? I mean, yeah, we find ourselves, even when we believe in Jesus, we still question a lot of times, right? I mean, it's just, it's just nature. Our mind, it's just the way it works and goes. We question, right? We have questions or we question, right? So I kind of want to start from that perspective today of um, the different... Um, questions that we typically have, believers and unbelievers alike, that we have for God, right? And a lot of you guys mentioned a lot of those different things, right? Okay, so let's start out with one question. How do we know that there is a God? How would you answer that? Huh? Creation. Who else has something? I've experienced, okay? Miracles. So seeing signs and wonders, evidence. Faith. Faith lets you know that there is a God, okay? What do you say, Don? Universal morality. That's good. It's another theory, right? Fulfill prophecy, okay? His word, okay, good. Anyone else? Holy Spirit relationship? You said relationship, Mike? Who was that? Who was that? Oh, Mike, yeah. His goodness. Okay. What else? The word we mentioned that. Anything else? Creation. Creation. Good. He talks to you. You may be crazy. He talked to you. She said God talks to her. Right? Anything else? Because, listen, you guys are evangelists. You have to know how to talk to people. Christians and non-Christians alike. Because sometimes Christians lose their way. And sometimes people, they know the Bible better than us, Right? Uh, homeless people and people on the streets and pre- they know the scriptures better than us and then you start to feel like oh I, I can't share Jesus with them right because they start to hit you with all of these humanistic questions right so let's talk about it okay so one theory um, that we have is called the theory of, of morality the theory of morality okay and what this is you know there are numerous kinds of moral theories and but what it is is, is how we determine right or wrong conduct like you said, in the heart, lift, you know, how we so like one time I was watching my son walk into a bedroom and it was dark. The lights were off and he just immediately started crying and started getting afraid because he felt it wasn't good. Him being in there by himself alone. Does that make sense? Even though I was right there in another room and I never showed him that. He's never seen that in me. He just went in there and he just started crying, you know, because he just sensed like it wasn't right for him to be in there by himself, you know. Um, and, and And so. You know, uh, how do we know there's, there's a God is, is because we understand through our natural understanding, right? And some of you guys mentioned uh, through creation, right? Who said that? You said that? Who else said that? You said that too, Tamla? Yeah, a lot of you guys said that, right? Okay, and that's what's called the theory of design is what that's called, the theory of design. The theory of design um, is when we observe the existence of God through creation, the way it was created, and the details and complexity points uh, us to believe that there is not poss- it's not possible for all these things we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all that, without a creator. Does that make sense? And it's similar to the theory of existence. The theory of existence is, which is basically anything that exists necessitates that, that God is, there's a creator. It, it's anything, right? It's, 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 it's when you say, you know what, for this to be here, there had to be somebody who produced it, right? For this to to go on, there has to be someone, like when you look at a video, the video just didn't come together on its own, right? You knew there was a producer, someone who created it, right? So you can view it. Does that make sense? Okay. 
And then some of you, uh, some of you guys talk about personal experience. Who talked about personal experience? Who said personal experience? Right. And that's what the Bible is mainly full of, right? You have what? How many? 40 different authors who talk about their personal experience with God, right? Which is our testimony is like the most powerful thing that we have as an effective witness tool to convey the reality of God because no one can take that away from you, right? Does that make sense? So you always, when you come to evangelizing, you always want to lead with your testimony, okay? Your real encounter experience with God. That's what changed Paul, right? Right? Amen? Okay. All right. Another question. How can there be a good God when there is so much evil and suffering in the world? Say it again. There's also a devil. Okay. So who's had this question before or, or, or heard this question before? <laughs> I ain't getting it out. See? Right. And that's kind of what Zach was saying, right? He was kind of saying about if, there, if there's a good God, then why are there so much suffering? So let's kind of let's, let's kind of go into that. So one 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 th- one thing that I tell people is that when we start to judge God, we're judging God based on well, following man's criteria when he's a spirit, right? So what we perceive and judge as good or evil um, doesn't necessarily mean it's so where where God functions. Does that make sense? And, and so it's kind of like if, if I see a, a mom and a, and a child arguing in the parking lot, I'm going to perceive and think I can't hear them, but I'm going to assume. I'm like, oh, man, either that kid did something wrong or either the mom is just has a short fuse is impatient. I'm judging it. But really, they could just be shouting and having they have a thing between them where they just they kind of do this play thing where they yell at each other, but it's really love. Do you, do you, does that make sense? So, so it's kind of, that, and that's kind of the thing that I'm talking about. We're, we're perceiving and judging good or evil based on what we think is good and evil about God. Like when people read the Bible and say, why is there so much killing in the Bible when God says not to kill? And right, we had these, we had these questions, right? Who's been there? Y'all been there? Okay. So we, when it comes to, when it comes to good and evil, we, the knowledge we come into about the darkness is because God is light. That's how we have such a profound understanding of darkness, because God is light, right? We have morality because we believe that there is a God that exists, right? And so, and, 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 so, and if we look at the, uh, the Old Testament, sin could not stand in the presence of God, right? Adam and Eve had to be pushed out of the garden, right? The priests, if they had any sin on them, they would drop dead. Right. That's why Jesus had to come. So that tells you that that, you know, because people because people want to judge God with evil. But we see what happens when actual evil or sin is in his presence. What happens? It, 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 it can't it coexist with him. We see what happened. Right. And and, and, and that's just what it is. But I, I, I think that when, when people ask me that question, um, it, it, it furthermore encourages me to share with them the need for a savior, the need for Jesus. God, Jesus is the full representation of God in man form, right? So God doesn't want us, you know, deliberately going through all this suffering, all different things of that nature. He is, it's not his, his perfect ideal for us to go through those things, but he allows those things before certain purposes and plans that he has in his mind. Does that make sense? And, and so, but that's the furthermore reason for us to talk about Jesus and to share with Jesus with people to understand, no, all you see is going on. This is God loving us so much to give us choice in a fallen world. God loves us so much that he gives us a choice to choose to do good or evil, to choose to do right or wrong. To choose, he gives you the choice. That's true love. True love lets you choose, right? Because it's a relationship, right? Who's married in here? So who was married by force? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Another sermon, another day, woman of God. Everybody else. <laughs> You see, you, you got married because you chose to be married, right? Is that the case? You chose to be married, right? And that's, that's your full expression of love. Now, whether you are happy with that commitment or not, that's, that's another story. But you chose to get in covenant with that person willfully because of how you felt at the time for that person, what you projected and what you thought, correct? And that's the way God's nature is. God wants you to choose him. He doesn't want this, you know, qualifying things. He wants you to want to develop a love relationship with him to understand him. Does that make sense? That's what he wants. Okay? 
All right, another question. How can, there, how can the belief in God be reconciled or proven with science? A lot of times people want to know, people base their theories and everything off science, right? Can it be proven by science? Who's ever tried to prove God through science? Case for Christ? What are you going to say, Zach? <laughs> right. Wow. Wow. Signs 400 years ago? Right. Well, yeah, and then he's just talking about science is always changing and always evolving, right? You think about Darwin, right? Who was a, you know, Charles Darwin was a, you know, noted scientist and naturalist, right? And even when it came to the end of his life, he verbally admitted that he wasn't sure about his theories. He said that. They don't teach that part, but that's what he said. And his life is kind of like, you know what? I don't, I don't really know if I was right about evolution and all of that, right? And, and he even said that, right? So it, you're, you're right. And so, um, okay, another question. How can the Bible be trusted? Because man wrote it, and man can control you with it, and we hear that too, right? Who's ever heard that? So how can, how can the Bible be trusted? Who wants to talk about that? How can we trust the Bible? Pastor, how, how, how can we trust the Bible, sir? Lots of anecdotal evidence. Okay. Mm. The tomb was empty. Wow. Praise God. <laughs> Y'all give it past to Anthony. The tomb was empty. Yeah, because we have 66, what, canonized books in the Bible, right? I'm coming to you, Chase. And then you have 40 different authors, that story is somewhat intertwined, right? And then also in just world history, there are things that coincide with what's in biblical history, right? Like the Egyptians, the Romans, the things of that nature, right? They kind of coincide. What were you going to say, Chase? Wow, divisible by seven. They had people to prove that the Bible was divisible by seven. Yeah, and, and archaeologists have a lot of findings, right? There have been a lot of, a lot of archaeological findings. I'll come to you when we got yes, done. Uh huh. The Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay. Is it Isaiah? Wow. Right, Isaiah talks about a lot about who Christ is. Okay. Right. Seven hundred years. Happen. Yeah. Praise God. See y'all y'all study the word in here, huh? Yes. Uh I'm I'm gonna come to you, Brady. Okay, Chase, what did you have? That was it? Oh, you there you go, Don. You you had it done? Okay, Scott Brady. Okay. So it was inspired by people who direct who had direct communication who got a heard from God, right? What they wrote. People still wouldn't believe that God himself wrote it. Right. They can just generalize and make it whatever they want to make it, right? Okay, anyone else? Yes, Mick. Because it's just this. It's just this. Stop being stupid. It's, you know God's real. Uh-huh. Okay. You just know. But for what about all those people who just discredit it because what that would call is a religious bias right yeah yes uh-huh no no go ahead
Uh-huh. Why you believe what the teacher's telling you instead of not the Bible? How do we know that science is real? Right. Uh-huh. Right. So you know the gospel because you feel you know it happen it's happening every day. But people still can go, well, I don't feel it. I don't, you know, it, no matter what you say, they can just discredit it. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. You want to support what Megan said? <laughs> Perspect it's your perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. They choose not believe. Right. From the culture, uh huh. Right. Okay. Oh, you're gonna add some science to that. Okay. We know in your mind, okay. Right, it is. So you can renew your mind, and that's in the Bible, okay. R- right. Okay. Wow. Taking uh, the verse in the Bible, taking captive your thoughts and bringing it to be in the Christ. Uh huh. Oh. Yeah, I feel people just turn off their live feeds right now. Like that's the devil. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, next question. How can a loving God send people to hell? That's a good one, right? He doesn't. Come on, Thelma, give it to me. Well, okay, well, what about the people who never hear the gospel? No, that's not true. Because that's why Jesus told us to go out and preach the gospel, right? Okay. Yeah, because that's why he sends us out, right? There, there are people who haven't heard the gospel in remote places. That, like in North Korea, the gospel is not allowed to be preached, right? Uh, a certain place where people persecuted, right? So there are people who have not heard the gospel, right? So what about those people? Those people go to hell, Tara, Thelma? What about those people? What does God do with those people? I, I, I'm asking you, scholar. Yeah, okay, we're going to go into that. I'm just, I'm just getting you guys food with thought. I'm going to go into these things and explanation later on, but I want to see where you guys thinking are when it comes to these things. Yes, that's done. Right, how can, a, how can a loving God, the original question, how can a loving God send people to hell, but then what about the people who don't hear the gospel or, you know, who never, okay, go ahead, done. Well, it's a dialect, right? It's, it's, it's coming off the heels of. Okay, every nation, tribe, tongue. They will know. Okay. Right. Reading the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Right. Philip to to minister to him. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, he's already revealed the creation and conscience. Right. I 
Okay, y'all agree? Faith of a mustard seed? But what if I'm someone who has never heard, knew, known anything about religion, knows anything about, like, my life is great. I have a good job. I have a good environment. But I just don't know anything about Jesus. But Jesus said, follow me. Uh-huh. Okay, they struggle with alcohol or some kind of addiction, uh-huh. Okay. The Holy Spirit worked for them to come to service. Right. So that's kind of evangelism, right? And that's one of the needs for evangelism, right? Because some people, some people just don't know. You know? They just don't know. They never heard or just don't know. Yes, no. Okay. All to the unknown God. Right. Right. We create the worship. Uh huh. Right. Right. Uh huh. Good. Right. Wow. Okay. So then the question becomes, why wouldn't a loving God allow people to go to hell, right? Because they have a, some kind of a revelation of him or, you know, things of that nature, right? Okay. We're going to move on, God. I know we can stay on that, but I'm going to go into those things later on. I just want to kind of see what you guys are thinking and stuff like that. So I'm just trying to, I'm poking a stick at you guys. You Christians say, oh, no, Jesus is the, I'm like, yeah, I know, but what if I'm unbelieving? No, it just is. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Another question. How can Christians say their religion is the only true one? Is the hot button for Zach? Okay. The truth and the life. Yeah, but I don't I don't believe that when I see all the other religions. I see Hinduism, I see Buddhism, I see Muslims, I see Jews. Why, why is, why is, so you think God just going to let billions of people die just because of, you know, a few of y'all believe in his son and, and that's all that's all there is? It's just, it's just Jesus? You mean to tell me that no one else can, God just loves only the Christians and no one else? Yeah. Right. God shows people very small community compared to the rest of the world. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And you think about it, too, with these other religions. These people have found peace, and they found comfort in what they believe. It's, it's, you, you know what I'm saying? So it, these are the questions I get asked when I'm, when I'm ministering to people out in the world. They don't believe, like, we understand, we get it in here. But I'm thinking for those who don't get it, who don't, you know what I'm saying, who have these biases that they're like, no, nah, they get offended because they see, like, they look at all, they've been, especially people who travel the world and seeing different things, right? And they're thinking, like, oh, no, God loves all of this, right? How can Jesus be, how can Jesus be the only way when there's so many different peoples and tribes and tongues out here and religions? How can that, how can that be? Well, but that's a bias, to people who don't, you see what I'm saying? You're very strong about that with people who agree with you. But with people who don't have that same bias, how do you convince them and get them to understand that the Bible is the only way? When their whole lives, they all, they all grew up Muslim or they all grew up believing this way. Does that make sense? It's not just going to, they're not going to receive just because we're saying it is. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, that's, but that's my, but yeah, but my wording is how do we influence, how do we share this with people so where they can receive it? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. They, it's always something they have to do for, for their God and their religion. That's good. It's prescriptive, right. Act space, right. 
Ah, uh, uh, come on now. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. What our God has done for us, right? What do you have, Tara? It's faith, your account of Christ, right? Right. Yes. Right. Mm hmm. Wow. It's good. Have you had the same encounter? Right. I never encountered him. Right. And and that's my premise. I'll come to some of you guys in here, but that's my premise. What I'm saying, like w like I was telling um, Mike Shalom is in the in the back. I know what I want to teach y'all and what I want to say, but I have to format it to where it's receivable. Does that make sense? It's like if I just start teaching the book of Revelation without giving you an understanding, you look at me like, hmm? Like Michael and I both, we, we design websites. So it's, 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 the, it's the equivalent of if I were to show him a whole screen of coding, he'll totally know what the website will look like. But if I show y'all guys those numbers and those codes, y'all be like, what is this? Right? But if I show you what the coding produces, which is what you're looking at the website, you're actually looking at a bunch of numbers and codes. But what they produce when you enter those things in, in that format, does that make sense? So what I understand from God, it's coded, but I have to decode it and uncode it to get people to understand. That's why I do a lot of illustrations, a lot of different things to help you understand because I understand the way he teaches me is not the, is not the reality of how I should teach it to you. Does that make sense? And so I'm trying to get you guys to understand it. So when you're evangelizing, you, you, you got to be careful to, to not be so strong about your experience and what you think over and understanding where this person really is. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Right. The testimony breaks the ice. Yeah. Right. There you go. And you're meeting them where they are, right? In human experience. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Take one more. In school, you learn about different religions, okay. Uh huh. You found something in Christianity that's not in every religion? Uh huh. Love. That God is loving them, yeah, and they don't, okay. Okay, so they're working to get to a place. Okay, so on the heels of that, don't all religions lead to the same God? Why not? Why not? Different? Okay, so what do Hindus believe? Hindus do what? They worship, they believe in a, in a oneness, but, but, it, but it's, it's divided in like 300,000 some gods, right? Right? Um, what about Buddhists? Do they believe in the same God that we do? Do Buddhists even believe in God, a, a God? No, they don't believe a God or really a higher power, really, right? It's more about self-empowerment, self-development, self, you know, um, just, just believing in oneself more so, right? And finding solace and peace within oneself, right? Okay. Okay. What about, what about, uh, what about Muslims? What do they believe? They believe in Allah, one supreme and powerful God. Uh, who, who's powerful, who's just, but who's also distant, right? They don't believe that God has a son, and they, they believe in God, and they acknowledge Muhammad as the chosen vessel to speak on God's behalf, the prophet, right? Right, you, you don't have a relationship with him, right? He's distant, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the rub they have with us as Christians. They acknowledge Jesus as a prophet, but not as a son. Very prescriptive. God of judgment. Yeah, because Muslims, they basically have what they call the, the pillars of Islam. It's five pillars, right? Who knows what those pillars are? Y'all know the five pillars of Islam? Y'all need to know this. <laughs> you, you, you talking to people, you need to know these things. When you evangelize, you need to know and understand these different religions and different things when you're talking to people. Paul says, I become all things to all people, right? People know more about Christianity that don't believe than we do about other religions and beliefs. But how are we going to be effective witnesses if we don't understand and know where they're coming from and what they're doing? We, we just, we'll just start saying stuff. But we need to know. And it'll show them, oh, wow, you do know about what I believe. It just opens them up when you know. 
Does that make sense? If you educate yourself, it shows you care. You know, just because it's wrong or it's not the right thing or what, what you perceive doesn't mean at the time it's right to them. And if you come off offending them and not knowing and talking down to it, you're going to lose them. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give it up. But does that make sense? All right, five pillars of Islam. One of the biggest things about Islam is that they, it, it's their profession of faith, like we talked about. They believe in, Al, they believe in one God, Allah, right, and they out, through the prophet Muhammad, okay? That's, that's one of the things, and that's their, that's their profession. Into, in, as being a Muslim, you have to acknowledge those two things, God, Allah, as the only God, and then Muhammad as the prophet that he sent, okay? All right, second, they, they pray. They pray uh, towards Mecca, okay? So when you hear uh, that, that sound going off, who's ever been to Israel? And you've heard the call to prayer that the Muslims have? Yeah, and, they, and they'll stop at noon, and so they pray five times throughout the day, and wherever they are, if they're on the road, they'll stop, pull over, they'll pull the rug out, and they'll start to pray, and they all are praying toward Mecca, and they have to do that five times a day. When we were in the air airport in Dubai, it was silent in there, but the only time it would come up when it was the times to pray is when you would hear anything across the, uh, the, the, the PA system is when it was to pray. So they would, they would, everyone would stop working, and they would start praying right where they were. I saw people on the side of the road stopping, throwing rugs out, and praying five times out the day when we were over in uh, Dubai. Does that make sense? So prayer is another thing. That's, it's another pillar that they have in, in their Islam faith, okay, in their Muslim faith, okay? Uh, third, giving alms. Giving is very big in the Muslim community. That's why they, they build great buildings and great, you know, places, and, and, and wealth is very important to them because giving is a very large part of what they do in their faith. Giving is another reputation to them of, of, of being godly and doing things with giving alms, okay? All right. Number four, fasting. Who's ever heard of Ramadan? What is Ramadan? Sun up, sun down fasting, right? It's what they do every year uh, in, in, in honor of what they believe, okay? Uh, they eat all night? Yeah. Okay, and then fifth, if five, is pilgrimage. They are, if they have the money and they have good health, they are required to go to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. Okay? They are required to go to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. Okay, if they're Muslim. Okay? And those, in simple form, that, those are five pillars of Islam. Okay? All right. Okay, so moving on. All right, so, um, and we talked about what, what about those who didn't, who didn't hear the gospel, right? Okay? So we talked about that. Okay. Yeah, and that, and that was really tough. To Zach's point, he said, these are some tough questions. These are really tough because are you, are you guys winning souls for God? Who's won souls for God in here? We all should be winning souls for God, okay? And you'll find out that people in the church have not believed in Jesus. They go, they, they, they attend, they have a Christian family, but they never made the confession. So check. Ask them, when did you become saved? When did you, oh, well, I went to church my whole life. And yeah, but when did you make the confession? Oh, I never done that. And you'll be surprised how many people you see every Sunday have not done that. Right, Tara? Right. Right. That's the enemy is done, Mike. Gotcha. Exactly. The dedications and stuff like that. Mike knows. He, he grew up Catholic, right? Him and Jim over there. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about that. Okay. So let's answer this question. So uh, I want to go into Matthew uh, 27, um, verses 50 through 53, NIV version, okay? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna answer that question with some biblical text, okay? All right. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At, the mom, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Then the earth shook, the rock split, and then the, okay, pay attention to this. And the tombs broke open. The tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Okay? 
They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Okay, so when Jesus died, he descended to the depths of hell. Remember, he was the first of the begotten. So these people didn't come out while he was still down there. They didn't come out before him. They came out after he came up. He came up. Does that make sense? He was the first of the begotten. So they, they, came, they came out after he came up, okay? And these people were walking around in their bodies, things of that nature, and, and people could see them. They were like, oh, these are saints of old, things of that nature, right? So let's look at it and see what, what happened in that, in, that, in that split that we see where these people come out of these tombs. So we're going to go on to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, okay? We're going to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, NIV version. Okay. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to men. He took many captives, right? So in hell, there were people who, who heard and knew about Jesus from the time of Genesis and who was waiting for his return, who died waiting for his return. Who died waiting for him, to, not his return, him to come. Does that mean, they, they didn't get to see him, get to hear his message. So they were, they were being held captive by the enemy. Okay, and so when Jesus went down, he, he shared the message with them. They received, and they all came out with him. Does that make sense? And I personally believe that's still what happens today when people don't hear the gospel and they die. Does that make sense? Huh? In trans time, amen. Amen, and so we'll read the rest of that. Uh, we're at verse 9. Okay. What does he ascend mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. And it had, hap and, and it had to happen this way because Jesus was the first of the begotten, so this didn't take place until he rose from the dead. And so that's what it was, right? Which, and that's kind of one of the things that God has led me to share with people, okay? All right. So, all right, another question. Can I be sure if I'm going to heaven or hell? Like, I hear a lot of Christians questioning their salvation. You ever been there? I wonder if I'm saved or if I'm going to heaven or hell. You ever, you ever thought that to yourself based on some of the things you've done and said and what you keep habitually doing and sinning and doing? You ever thought like that? Yeah, Mike, I know, Mike, me too. Yeah, Joy, right? Yeah, you tell me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what does Romans 10, 9 tells us? We're going to go into that. Romans 10, 9, um, NIV version. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes, you know, uh, Jesus said, you know, anyone who believes in me will never be put to shame, right? Um, and it says in verse 12, for there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I know I didn't add that in there, but, but we know that's what it is, right? So how do we come out of thinking or, or second guessing we're going to go to heaven or hell? How, how some of you guys come out of that? Yeah, Mike. You got to learn a different way and really search. Okay, because, yeah, we're, because we, when we're Christian, but we're thinking like that, that means we're condemned, right? We're condemned in our thinking. There's something or some, some experience or something that's condemning us and making us think and question our salvation. Yes, Tara. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. Because grace and mercy because of what God did, right? But what if I keep sinning and I like sinning? Yeah, I love God, but I like to do what I'm doing that's wrong. Is that bad? You got to build a relationship with God. It just feels good, though. Oh, I have, but I like what I do. Mm 
Okay, okay. Then what happened to Judas then? He walked away. Peter walked away. But he walked away. Thomas didn't believe it. I know, but they had these moments where they didn't, they questioned, they didn't believe it, they, they turned away, is what I'm saying. And they were right there and they tasted it, to your point, is what I'm saying. I know the result, woman of God. But I'm, I'm saying, but they were right there with him and they turned away. Does that make sense? So you can taste the goodness of God and turn away. No, no, she's mentioning the fact that Satan turned away from God. Uh Uh-huh, it's of the devil. Uh Uh-huh, right. Right, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. That's good, Stella. Okay, we we getting it we getting it started in here, huh? This is good because this is reality. Right? And these are the hard things I have to tell people. It's because they're they're saying these things, but I see the stronghold. And where they're not allowing God to be God. And why their life is going a certain way. And they keep blaming God and everyone else when really they haven't given up this thing they really don't want to give up. Does that make sense? I'm giving y'all reality. I know what we all believe in here, but I'm telling you what's really going on out here. And what's really going on out here is not the same as what we're all talking about today. Yes, Lord. Romans 8, verse 1. There's now no condemnation. Uh-huh. But, but, but what do... But, for it's realization, like you guys have been talking about, right? It's repentance. But, but do y'all, are, are y'all understanding my point? We know all of this, but yet we still choose to do what we're doing that's not right, is what I'm talking about. It's a choice, right? Why don't we give up these things when we know better, is what I'm trying to get after. No, we've experienced God, but why don't we give it up? When we know and we've experienced God, I'm talking about people who know God, who've experienced God. Why don't you give these things? Why couldn't Judas let go of his mindset with money is what I'm saying. It wasn't demonic oppression. He was already thinking that way. That was his own nature, thinking the way Satan came and assisted it, but he was already thinking that way. Satan entered him later on. He already had the what? Right. Right, that he never checked, right? He just reasoned and thought. Remember, when he was there, at the, when Jesus was being anointed, right, he said, oh, this could have been sold for money. That was him. Why is this wasted on you? Okay. Yeah, but sometimes it's just us. It's just us. We can't keep blaming the devil, guys. It's us. He comes because of the way we're thinking. Say, Jesus told his disciples what? Satan wants to do what? Shift y'all as we. So the enemy wasn't there yet. They were, out, they were thinking in a way that was going to bring upon Satan on them. But he wasn't there yet. He said, but I pray for you guys. Right. Paul tells us that too, right? He was always with me. Do you see? It feels good. Now Sue preaching. You preaching now, Sue. It feels good, right? For a while. Then what, Sue? Then the, then, the, then the consequences come, right? Yeah. Because you know the truth. Right. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he said, what have I done? I betrayed innocent, and he wouldn't go kill himself, right? Because of that guilt, that, that heaviness of what he'd done. And that's what sin should convict us, of course, but not condemned, but convicted. But he felt he was condemned. Yes. Is he a sin because he had a sin for nature?
Okay. Okay. You have the same feeling in you? Uh huh. Right. There it is right there. You said it. It's like we all have this superficial belief in God toward ourselves, right? Oh, God will forgive me. God won't hold this against me. You have a seared conscience, right? That's why you do it, because you have a seared conscience, because you're right there in the camp. You know all the Christian songs and scriptures and, you know, know how to put the Christian appearance on, so you're thinking you're okay. And that's been one of the most challenging things to do with certain people that I minister to is that when they have that mindset, you, you can't tell them anything differently. Because they just, they just keep going back to, well, I know Pastor Eric said that, and that's true. But God loves me, so it don't matter. But if you do it, if they see you doing the same thing, they'll judge you and call you out and condemn you. And they're doing the same thing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Born sin nature, uh-huh. Yeah. You never have to teach children how to be bad. Right. That's true, sir. Okay. So I know we can keep going, but I want to I want to share a quick testimony, y'all, that or where I found myself in this place with God. In 2008, um, I lost a lot of my family members in 2008. Um, I lost uh, an uncle. He was 50 years old. He died of a heart attack. Uh, and this was when I was really, this, this was coming off the heels of me coming back from Israel. And I was, I felt so close to God. I felt so on fire for God. And then, you know, in 2008, we know our economy crashed. We had a lot of bad things going on. Who remember, who, who remembers 2008? It's just a year you just didn't want to live in, right? It was just so bad that whole year, right? And, and on top of all the different things, I, uh, you know, I lost an uncle. And then maybe a few months after that, in the beginning of the year, I lost my brother. He was shot and killed by a police officer. And then two weeks after my brother's funeral, I had a cousin, 15-year-old cousin, who died on the basketball court in a tournament of a seizure. And then after that, uh, my best friend, father passed away, who, who was really, I was really close to. And then my aunt passed away. Then I had a grandfather that passed away. So, and I just, I, and then their birthdays kept rolling around, right? And this is on both sides of my family. And I felt like the closer I got to God, it was my fault that these people were dying. Because it wasn't until I started pursuing God that I started losing people. And that's the way I started thinking. I started thinking, you know what? This is my fault. Because if I didn't get so close to God, then these people wouldn't die, right? You ever thought like that? When things happen and you blame yourself? And you say it's because of me. Does that make sense? So I, uh, and then, um, so for a while, I didn't, I didn't really preach or share about God for a while because I was, I was just hurt. I was wounded. I was just kind of like going through it. And then um, in 2011, uh, my mentor, my pastor, my prophet, she died. And that was it. I was mad at God now. Now I was mad. You know? And I was like, I just don't understand you. I don't get this. This is how you reward your servants. This is what you do. You know, and I was just, I was angry. I would blame myself, but then I was angry. And because it just, it just hurt a lot, right? Because I would go to her. I, would, I mean, a lot of the relationship you guys have with me is what I had with her, right? And she was my go-to person. After I talked to God, after I prayed, I would go, okay, well, let me see what she's saying, what she's getting from God. And I didn't have that anymore, Right? And it, it could you could you imagine not call, calling me and I'm not I'm not here anymore? Could you imagine that? That's what it was for me. The way you feel when you believe that you need me is what she was to me. On top of all these other things that I went through. So you can understand it. That's how special she was to me. I, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for that woman. Do you see? So, and, and, uh, and I questioned God a lot. I, I was like, people would come up and I would, you know, how you, I would hear certain things when people sat in front of me as a, I was a trainer and I wanted to say something about God, but I wouldn't. Because I was wounded. Right? I, I didn't, I, like, I didn't want to open my mouth. I didn't want to share. I didn't want to talk. Cause I was like, I, I, I can ruin this person's life. I could, you know how it goes. It starts with how you internalize, and then you just project it on everything, right? And now you're afraid to do anything with anybody because you feel like, oh, if I share this with them, they're going to die. If I tell them this, they're going to die. Something's going to, the 
God's going to allow the devil to do something, so I, it's better for me not say anything. And that's the way I was thinking because of my experiences. Does that make sense? So, I, um, and then, and, and then, but I, I couldn't deny the calling on my life, right? I, I, it's, the, it's that complexity, right? You go through life and you're just like, I'm done with God, I'm done with the church, I'm done with people, they're crazy. I'm done with, you know, marriage. I'm done with everything, right? Because everything just beats you up, right? And you just, you just don't want to feel anything. You, and then, you know, you have one major thing going on, and then you just connect it to everything else that, that's wrong in your life, at work, with family, health, money. You just, you just, it's just a whole tornado full of problems, right? And you don't want to do anything, right? And that was me for a while. So, and what, um, what, what really changed it for me was, um, when I when I started I started I, but I still I still read the Bible the entire time and I started reading Job, and when I started really read Job I've read Job numerous times but I really read Job right and as I was reading Job I started identifying and it started to bring healing in my heart, you know unknowingly it was starting healing my heart of everything I went through, then, uh, I felt myself slowly starting to share the gospel with people again. And slowly do those things I used to do again and things of that nature. And God was healing and delivering me. And, and then so, at, and, and then the, the final healing part of it was in, I think, 2012. We, uh, we were doing a, uh, it was before I met Michael and the guys here. We, we had a men's group. And so um, meeting at uh, one of my friends, John Bax's house. And so this, this, uh, this woman who was prophetic came up to me and she looked at me and she said, you know, you're, you're one of God's favorites. And she said, what, what you've gone through being with God, a lot of people would turn away from him for. And she just started crying. And that brought so much encouragement and so much comfort. During those times I was going through those things, no one could counsel me. No one could talk to me. There was nobody I had around me who could minister to me through these things I was going through. These are things I just had to go through and, and learn and grow in the things of God on my own. Does that make sense? Because I was the counsel and the help for everybody, right? But I lost my, I lost my counsel. I lost my mentor. You see? So, but it really brought comfort. Reading the book of Job and, and then hearing from this woman of God really encouraged me. And then later on, that's when I met Michael and all you guys here today. It led to that. But I, I received healing. So I want to I encourage you guys today. I want you guys to stand up for a second. And I, and I want to pray for you before I go into this next segment, okay? Because there are a lot of you guys here who are dealing with these non-negotiables with God. These things that you felt so strongly that were God, that you were told, that was confirmed, that was all different things, and then it panned out the way you didn't expect it to. I want to pray for you, okay? I want to pray that you make it more about the relationship with God than the lack of or the non-existent manifestation that you don't see. Amen? What did Sheriff Michigan and Benigo say? O King, live forever. Our God will deliver, but even if he doesn't, we know our role. We're not to bow. And that's the way God said I needed to be. He said, you, to do this, son, what I've called you to do, you have to do it the way they did it. He said, if you do it that way, you'll succeed. So it's not giving God an out. It's just a high revelation. Because we limit, we go or stay based on manifestation. Do you see? But really, God wants you to make it about you and him. Do you have enough proof and evidence to know that there is a God, even though things that you've been praying for or didn't want to happen, still happen. Amen? So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now, God, who are at those sticking and stuck points right now, Father God, who are dealing with double-mindedness, God, who are dealing with confusion, God, God, who are dealing with fe fearfully going forward, Father, and have an uncertain future right now, and, and they believe in you, God, but they don't trust you, God. Father, they've been hurt. They've been let down. They've been confused. They, they have misunderstandings, God. There's anxiety, God. There's great loss, God, when they believe so greatly in you, Father, for these things, Father. Father, they don't know whether they're coming or going, God. They don't know whether they should go back or not, God. They don't know what they should do, God, because of what's happened, Father. And, Father, I just pray for my brothers and sisters, just like right now, you reconcile those things for me with the deaths in my family and my life, God, that, 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 that these accounts with you and these relationships with you would be reconciled here today, God. That they release, God, the disappointments, God, the failures, God, the rejections, God, the abandonments, Father God, the ridicule, Father God, the what's been stolen from them, Father God, the, 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 their declines in health, God. All these different things, Father, that, that they believe to trust you for, 
that for some whatever reason didn't pan out a certain way that they expected, Father God. Father, I just speak healing in their hearts right now and reconciliation in their hearts right now. Father, your word says, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And Father God, we know where sin abounds. That much more does your grace abound, Father. So, Father, in your word, it says in Matthew 5, 4, that blessed are those who mourn for they shall receive comfort, God. So, God, as they're mourning these relationships, God, as they're mourning these losses, God, as they're mourning the, the hardships and the heartaches of yesteryear, God, or even presently, Father, God, I pray they re- receive and feel your comfort right now, God, that they would know that you still love them. You never left them nor forsaken them, Father God, and they would today reconcile their relationship just because of who you are, God, not because of what they have or don't have or what they received or didn't receive or who loves them, who doesn't, but because they know that you are, Father. I pray that them knowing that you are God will be enough for them, Father that you are God and God alone, God, and they, was, and they would not confuse the reality of who you are with the lag thereof of what they see in their lives in their different relationships, God. Thank you, Lord. I pray that we would have the same faith and the same connection with you as Sherrick, Michigan, and Benigo had, God. Well, they know their God can and will deliver, but even if their God, for whatever reason, doesn't, they don't bow to their circumstances. They don't bow to the broken relationships, God. They don't bow to money. They don't bow to the enemy. They don't bow to the flesh, God. Thank you, Lord, that we would keep that standard up, Father God, irregardless, Father. That, Father, in your word, it says those who were next to you were your chosen, called, and faithful. And God, I pray that they will be faithful in their callings and what you've chosen them to do, Father. I bless them now, Father. I speak inner healing in every heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. All right, y'all can be seated. Ooh, that felt good. Amen? How y'all doing? Y'all good? Okay, so we're about to close it out. But I, So now, I want to go into all those questions I asked earlier about why we're critical of God. Why, really, what is the core reason why we have these questions? Is there a God? Does he love me? Is he real? Yada, 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 yada. I want to go into the revelation I received from God about why we question or doubt or all of these things go on, okay? Can we do that? Okay, so in Psalm 1611, uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 11, the New King James Version, it says, you will show me the path of life, and in your presence is what? Fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are what? Pleasures forevermore. So I want you to hold that spot on, in your presence, there's fullness, right? In your presence, fullness of joy. Now we can understand why we are the way we are with God, by starting with Adam and Eve, okay? Adam and Eve were driven out of what? God's what? Presence. Because of what? Sin. Okay, so we're going to go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 13, okay? Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 13, New King James Version. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant, to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Uh, Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the what? They hid themselves from what? The presence, there's that word again, the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I've heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the the woman you gave to me, me, blame game. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. She passed the buck, right? And I ate. See, and I want to I, key in on this presence thing. See, a lot of us are hiding from God's presence. The reason why you question, the reason why you doubt, the reason why you're always up and down is because you're not in the presence of God. That's what your problem is. That's where all these questions come from, because we lack being in the presence of God. When they went in God's presence, they were, they were afraid, they were high, they were questioning him, 
They were blaming and not being accountable because they were not in the presence. Do you see? And so a lot of you guys are, are hiding from God. You, you're being smart in your eyes. People don't like being around me. Is that not true? Yeah, Thelma. Not, I know, not you, Thelma. But there are people who don't like being around me. Why do you think that is? Why do people not like being around me, Mike? Mike, Mike is a professor in this, in this field with me, so. If you weren't right in your place with God where you need to be, you didn't want to be around me. Do you see that? The same trend as Adam and Eve. They weren't right standing with God, so they what? They hid. They hid. That's what we're doing today. People come up to me, why aren't certain people here? And ah, come. Mm -hmm. It's the presence. Do you see? And that's what you lack. God, God didn't give up on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, God told you to get out the truck. Yeah. My, I had a, they had a, they, the, so the guys at the coffee shop, they had a chair for Michael for next to me, and Michael's outside this truck going, I'm not going in there, Lord. And he's like, yeah, you going. I don't want to go. I see Eric's car here. I'm not going in there. And he's like, yeah, you going. <laughs> Mike comes in. I'm talking. I'm like, hey, Mike. Mike's like, oh, uh, you know. <laughs> he got a chair right next to me, right here, brother. And he sits down next to me. He's just kind of like, and then, of course, I said, man, how you doing? I, don't, I said, I don't feel you. I don't, I don't feel that Mike love, man. I don't feel the energy. What's going on, man? And he just. He just was bracing himself for it. And, of course, I started ministering to him, of course, and then, but it was good. Well, it was, I say it's good. He, he may not agree. But that's what it is, guys. We lack the presence. Do you see? That's why you question, because you don't feel it. You don't encounter it. So when you don't feel God's presence, that's why you're unsure of yourself. That's why you question everything. Even things that you know are good and are right, you still question, because you're not in the presence. Does, does that make sense? It says in his presence, there's what? Fullness. But fullness, completeness, wholeness. You're not whole. You may not be healed. You're, not, you're dealing with these things because you're not in his presence. You're hiding. You're wanting the results of his presence, but you won't spend time in it. We want the touchy-feely. <laughs> you see? And then what else? We're blaming others. We're not being accountable. Just like Adam and Eve, right? See, God was looking for them just like he's looking for you. He's looking for you all the time, like you said, about, about our religion is where God comes from man and wants a relationship with man. Every other belief is about your, what you can do for God, but this one's about what God wants to do for you and how he loves you. And you're hiding and you're running. You don't want to be corrected. You don't want to say anything to you. But you need his presence. You see? And I truly believe that, that um, you know, this is where religion initially started. Because since then, it's been man's strive through their different religions and different science and different money to, to be close to God, to get to recapture their presence without actually being with God. We're trying to find all kinds of ways to replace God, right? Does that make sense? Hmm. Okay. So we're going to go into Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 to 24, okay? New King James Version. And it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest, lest, lest he put on his, uh, his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden till, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. So at this point, Adam and Eve have become like rebellious teenagers. Who's dealt with rebellious teenagers? And it's a, it's a fight over supremacy of the house, right? It's in your name. You're paying for it, but they're going to take over it. They tell you when to come pick them up, where to go, what to pay for. You're not going to come and embarrass me, my friend. You shut up, go to your room. 
I'm in charge, but just do whatever I need you to do because I can't fend for myself, but I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> and at this point, this is what Adam and Eve were. They were like te- rebellious teenagers. So God what? Put them out. He put them out. Right? Like some of y'all have to, right? Am I talking? Y'all haven't dealt with? Oh, yo, I'm talking to the wrong. Okay, I'm going to look at the camera. Hey, you guys at home, you know, watching. No. Yeah, you, you're fighting, right? You know the two of y'all can't contend in the same space any longer. Or y'all going to kill each other. Right? Because they got it all figured out, but they can't take care of themselves. But they're going to tell you how things are going to go from now on. They the new sheriffs in town, right? Right? Or were you the kid doing that to your parents, telling your parents what to do? Maybe that's what I need to say. Mike, like, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> do you see? Yeah, that's what so God put them out. See, and see, God is a loving God, but God is also God of justice. And his love doesn't cancel out his justice. That's why he lists the consequences of what we do sometimes we still face. Even though he forgives us and, you know, uh, he doesn't hold those things against us, but sometimes we still have to pay for it because he's a, God, he's a just God. Does that make sense? Okay. And he told them the consequence. If y'all do this, this is what's going to happen. You will die. Right? You'll be separate. You see? Okay. So let's go into Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 12, okay? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 12, NIV. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to what? Maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from the acts that lead to death, meaning you constantly just sinning, and of faith in God. Instructions about cleansing rites, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and, and, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those, to your, to your point, Don, which you were bringing up earlier. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Uh, Land that drinks in the rain often uh, falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those from whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it would be burned. Uh, Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case. The things that that have to do with salvation, God is, is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. What do we want you to become? We, we, don't, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Amen. See, it's all there. Um, so our true problem is with our relationship with God, right? It's our lack of spending time in his presence, our lack of listening to him, a lack of doing these things that connect us with him. So when we don't spend time in his presence, we act these ways. We keep sinning. We keep doing different things because we lack an encounter in the presence and the love of God. You need those things, right? Or you always keep looking for pick, spiritual pick-me-up is what I call them. Oh, Eric's going to pray for me, and I'm going to feel better. Or somebody's going to give me some money, and I'm going to feel better. no. No. What a God has given me to give you, yes, helps you, but it can't replace you spending time with God alone. What I have is the offspring of a relationship with God. I am not the relationship with God. But it's easy to do that with a person versus a relationship with God. And that's why people get irritated with me, again, being a prophet. Oh, well, he's going to just completely fix my whole life. Well, yes and no. Because there's a part you have. You see, it's like as a personal trainer, you know, my clients, they pay me money and they, they want these results and these goals. Right. So they see me maybe three times a week and they come in for maybe an hour, 30 minutes and work out. But then they eat whatever they want to eat. <laughs> they don't sleep. They don't do cardio. So what kind of results are they going to have? None. But who are they going to blame for it? Me. Why? I didn't do my job. I'm the expert. Right. They're paying money. Right. And they're thinking in their head, oh, I'm showing up and working out, but why well, I'm not seeing results. 
They exactly, but they don't they don't they don't hold themselves accountable for their part. They actually have the majority part in it. It's like I'm one fourth responsible, they're three fourths responsible. You can't blame me. You only see me an hour and a half a week, but you blame me for the results you have. And you know, right, they don't want to hear that though. Well, yeah, it's not that it's not that bad. I had a salad once. Right. But I, want, I need to reward myself with ice cream. I need to reward myself. Look at Zach. Zach's done with me. Zach's like, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'm like, shut up. That's me and my trainer. Shut up. Did you, you see that? And that's what people think because people have a perception of who, who I am and what I do. But then when I give them instructions, they don't follow them. They don't follow the instructions. And then yet, I still deal with them again because where else are they going to go? <laughs> You know what you told me, Eric? Yeah, yes, I didn't do it, but what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, take another lap there. Tara's my track star. She's not any longer, but she was. She was, she was, she was the captain of the track team. I was like, Tara, I got a word. She was like, ready, sit. I'm like, all right. The Lord says, bam, she just takes off. I see her running around. She comes right back. All right, Tara, you ready? Yeah. All right, Tara, just boom, she takes off again. <laughs> That's my girl now. Now she's a champion for God, right? Amen? Y'all give it up for Tara. I love Tara. But see, because I could see what God wanted to do. And that's why it's so important that when you minister to people and you lead people, that you have God's heart toward people. Because if you don't, if you don't spend that time with God and see who they really are, you'll get offended. You'll make it about you. And really, what's coming off as offense is really just, you know, somebody who really deeply loves God, who just needs the encouragement. Does that make sense? And that's why so, we miss so much when we want to spend time in God's presence. We miss a lot. You miss a lot. Okay? All right, because remember, in his presence there's what? Fullness of what? Okay, fullness of joy. I like, I like the way you said that, Thelma. Okay, so we're going to Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 36, okay? All right, NIV. All right, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up, on, went up onto a mountain to pray, and he was praying the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flashing light. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. Look at that. <laughs> That's what happens. When, 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 it's funny, because when, when there's an atmosphere in this room, a prophetic deliverance of, or healing, because people don't spend time with God, they don't know it's here. They get sleepy. You know why they get sleepy? Because that's what's in control, their flesh. When, 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 when Jesus came to the disciples to pray, they were doing what? Sleeping. He needed them. They were out, cold. Tw yeah. He said, you can't stay in, in, in praying watching me, really? I need y'all right now. Y'all out. Oh, he good. He Jesus. He all right. I'm just going to put my head on this little rock right here and just take a little. But it's funny, when the soldiers came, they all got up. Why? Flesh. Yeah, you, you, he didn't have to wake them up then. They got up because they heard the soldiers. They heard, they, heard the, they, they heard the noise. They heard the weapons. They got up because that's where they were functioning. <laughs> Do you see? Because when the presence of God enters in and comes into a room and, and fills that place, the, the, the flesh gets, ve it gets very weak. But the spirit is like, yeah, you know, you see, and then y'all, but then y'all see the offspring of it, of someone being healed, delivered, or prophesied to, but it's already here. The atmosphere, it's already here. It's charged. It's already here. Do you see? <laughs> okay. So what I leave off? Verse 30. Okay. Two men, uh, verse 30, two men, Moses and Elijah appeared in a glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they, they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He, didn't, he did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as the cloud, as they entered the cloud, the glory of God, right? And a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son who, I'm, who I've chosen. Listen to him. 
Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept them this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. So a lot of people call this the Mount Transfiguration, but actually it, it, it was Mount uh, Tabor, right? It wasn't the Mount Transfiguration. It, it, was, it was the place where he was transfigured. Okay, so, so let's make sure we understand that. But this is what happens a lot of times when we pray. When I spend time in God's presence, why I encourage you guys to pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit, is because I start to get visions. I start to see things. So a lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll notice me calling up people and telling them to what? Pray in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it gets them in tune with God and their spirit, and they start to see things and hear things. It starts to open them up to hear and receive from God. Because I'm discerning what's going on in the climate. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to get them connected to it. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's why it's important that you spend time with God's presence and you pray. Because it'll start to activate and open up your spiritual eyes and your ears so you can see things and hear things. Again, that's why you won't walk in confusion. They said if anyone, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask who. If you lack it. If you, meaning you don't have to. But if you do, ask God. Do you see? Good. All right. Luke 24, 13, 30 through 33. And then this is the uh, this one of the last scriptures, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, okay? All right. So now, this, at the same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus was right there, right? But they didn't recognize him. Okay? He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, thank you, bless you, brother, asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things <laughs> that have happened in these days? And then he's like, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one. Look at this. Look at this. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is that is, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us, uh, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are <laughs> and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wow. Did not the Messiah have to, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was, was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it was uh, nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he, and he disappeared from their sight. <laughs> they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to Jerusalem, to, to, to at, at, at once to Jerusalem. They found, there they found the 11 and, they, and, and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared uh, to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when they broke the bread. <laughs> Isn't that cool? But that's how he's with you guys. I read that to let you guys know no matter what you're going through, he's there. But it's your faith that gets a hold of him. The Bible says Christ dwells in our heart through faith. Okay? Through faith. Okay? So who, who knows what the holies of holies is? What is the holies, what is the holies of holies, Miss Penny? Right, they had a rope around the priest in case he fall down. Why, why would he fall down? The presence of God. Because if he had any kind of sin on him, going in the hose, hose, so once a year the priest would have to make atonement for the sins of the people, right? And he had to deal with his own sin. 
right? And so when he would go for the presence of God in the middle of the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant, if he had any kind of sin on him, he would drop dead. But if he dropped dead, they couldn't go in and get him because there's the presence of God. So they had to pull him out by the rope. Because <laughs> God's presence, that's, again, sin cannot exist in God's presence, right? And, and, and so, again, God's been making this effort throughout the generations to reconnect his presence with people. Because that's what we lost. Every man, every person is seeking that, that presence of God is to get back what we lost in our own way. Whether we call it the universe or science or self-reliance or wi- whatever we call it. We're all trying to reclaim that which Adam and Eve lost. Amen? But, ho- but we know that the only way to God is who? Okay, good. We're going to finish with that. So John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. All right, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in? My father has his house has many rooms. If, we're, if that were not so, would I have uh, told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Look at that. You know it. You know it. And we're like, no, no, no. You know it, right? Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know (laughs) where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, they call Jesus the second Adam. So one Adam lost the presence, but the second Adam is leading us back to the presence. Amen? And that's what we need, guys. We need to follow Jesus back into the presence of God. Because that's what we're missing. So when you get away from following Jesus, following the word of God, you're going to miss your encounters, your appointments, and their presence. Do you see? These things he's telling you is to get you back into that presence, to reconnect with your father. You need that. He says, apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Does that make sense? Okay. And so I, 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 I want you to understand how important. So when you do your Christian things and you're doing you know, your devotions or your prayers or your fellowship, it's important because these things are encouraging you in the presence of God. That's what you need. That's what you need. You don't need a word from Eric. You don't need hands laid on you. You need to get in his presence. Amen. And those things we do here are just to encourage you back, to lead you back into that presence. That's why he does it, because that's where we're functioning in the natural. That's what will bring the reality of God when, they, when you see manifestations. But it's not supposed to take God's place. It's supposed to lead you back to him. Does that make sense? That's why in the Gospels, Jesus comes in with signs and wonders. Why? To, convince, to, to confirm what they were saying was true. Do you see? That's the purpose of gifts. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So... Okay, y'all stand with me, and we're gonna um, we're gonna pray again. <laughs> okay, but that's the simple answer, guys. We have a critical spirit when it comes to God because we have not been in His presence. Okay, it's a long and short answer. Are you spending time in the presence of God? Because if you are, it'll start to settle those things that you question and get double-minded about. Okay, that's our core problem. We don't spend time in the presence. Okay, and I'm going to keep driving that and keep saying that. When you stop idolizing me and other people out here, you will idolize God. Don't make me an idol. Please don't, because I will disappoint you. Not because I live a sinful life, just because I'm a man. I'm, I'm not God, right? I'm here to point you back to him. I'm here to encourage you in him. I'm, I'm, I'm here to convey a jealousy in you to want more of God but not to be that. Would you see the things that God does through me here and through others here through the Holy Spirit is to encourage you that you can do the same thing. Okay? So please don't make it about me. I love you very much, but don't put me up there. Okay? Because I've had people do that. And there have been a lot of broken relations because people have put me in the wrong place because of what they see in my life. Okay? So please don't do that. I'm your brother. Okay? Amen? All right. Father, we thank you, God, that no longer we would have a critical spirit of our walks with you, Father. God, you are, a, you are a, a good, just, and loving God, Father, because that's what the Word tells us. That's what the Spirit tells us. 
That's how Jesus reveals your nature. And God, we accept what Jesus says about you. And so, Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters right now, Father God, that they will have a hunger and a thirsting to spend time in your presence, God. That they will make time in their schedules, that they will be intentional about spending time in your presence, God. Father, they will hear you, they will see you, they will know you. They will grow in love, Father God. They will understand their purpose, the plans, the calling, your nature, God, your word, God, whatever it is they're facing, Father God. To let them know that you're right there with them, Father. You never left them nor forsaken them, Lord. And God, I thank you right now, Father God, that your presence is here. And God, in your word it says, in your presence there's fullness of joy. Thank you, God, that joy is being restored today. Hope is being restored today. Love is being restored today. Patience is being restored today. Faithfulness is being restored today. Self-control is being restored today. Love is being restored today. Lord, I thank you for being a restorer and reconciler of all things, God. That Jesus, you are truly the, the truth, the way, and the life. And so, Jesus, I pray that, that we will all follow you as you usher us back into the presence of God. Because we need that, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I just pray for each and every person here, no matter what level we are on spiritually, God, that we will have just a, a, a supernatural hunger and a thirsting of your living water, of that presence, of that love. Even if we fall asleep, God, I pray they would know that they would know that they are in your presence and that they are carriers. They, they, their bodies are the temples of God. They are carriers of your presence, Lord. So, Lord, I pray they be confident in knowing that when they share the gospel, they're sharing you. That when they speak your word, that you manifest on the scene, God. And that that person gets catapulted in your presence of what they're talking about, God. They, they experience the reality of what they're sharing, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. So Lord, I thank you right now, Father God, that we will get back to having our quiet times. We will not be distracted. We will not be discouraged. We will not uh, be tempted to do anything other, God. But I set our sights and focus on you. Your word says in Isaiah 26, 3, that you will keep us in perfect peace. We might have stayed on thee because they trust in you. So, Lord, I pray that not, they will not only believe in you, but they will trust you, God. And the only way they can trust you and know that you're the truth is that in your presence. So I just pray, Father, that they will feel your presence like never before, Father God. And they will connect and commune and bask in that presence, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I bless them now, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to tell God you love him. Just think about him. Just tell him you love him. Worship him. Just love him. Because he's worthy. Because he's your God. He's your father. Doesn't matter what's going on, what didn't happen, what he is worthy, right? And see, this is what we have to do. This is how you get out of your flesh and into the spirit. You enter his courts and gain thanksgiving with what? Praise and thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. That's how you enter in. The perfect will of God is for you to give thanks in all things. You see? Not come in complaining, being critical, but giving thanks because of who he is. It's okay for you to cast your cares upon him because he tells us that. But we want to enter in. We want to go into that holy of holies with God. We want to encounter with that presence with God. We don't want to just want to lay off our complaints and drop it off and go. We want to encounter with God. That's what changed these men and women in the Bible, their encounters with God. And that's what we need. We need an encounter with God. We need an experience like Paul had on Damascus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. That's it. Yep. A lot of y'all are feeling it now. Some of y'all are, are feeling the heat. Some of y'all are feeling the wind, the cold. Some of y'all are feeling the chills, the, the goosebumps. Some, some of y'all are feeling that burning inside. Some of y'all are starting to see things. Some of y'all are hearing things from the Lord. That's it. See, it's right there. You just activate it by going to the Spirit, making it about Him. If you set your sights on God, you will immediately start to come into that awareness of who He is, that, that consciousness of God. Guys, this is my secret. I just learn and train my, my mind and my body to submit to the spirit. 
And that's all the Bible tells us. It's, 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 it's teaching you mentally and physically how to submit and retrieve and, and encounter that which is already within you. See, Jesus told us that, that we must worship the Father in the spirit and the truth, for the Father, what? Seek it such. He's looking for people who's going to honor him and connect with him in the spirit and the truth with the right heart and the right understanding. And that's what you're doing right now. So important. And this is getting rid of the criticalness, the offense, the bitterness, the hatred, the anger, the all the different hard things that we deal with. This is what this is what helped me release a lot of those things. It's been a time in his presence. Yeah. Jesus would do this as often. He would go off and often at night and spend time with God all night in his presence. That's why he was so victorious. That's it. Reconnect with your father. We need to, guys. Thank you, Lord. See, and this is what helps you release those strongholds, those sins you don't want to give up, those secret sins. Those things that are hard to let go because you found comfort and pleasure in, in life and which are really death. This presence of God is what takes that taste out, takes that desire out. It's what helps you overcome those things that you can't overcome in your own strength. He said, in me there's fullness. In his presence there's fullness. And you need that experience. That's why it's been so hard to let go of things and get over things because you haven't spent enough time in the presence. That's it. See, if you just encounter and receive this presence, I wouldn't even need to pray for you to come out of addictions and things. You just walk right out of it. You just walk right out of it. You just walk right out of sin. Because you recognize the truth. You understand the truth. You, you will be the, you, you would inhabit the truth and know it. He said, you will know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. You will own the truth and you will walk right out. You will walk right into your freedom out of your prison. That's it. See, Jesus told, you know, the Romans, right? He said, nobody takes my life, <laughs> but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I take it up again. See, he had no restraints. He submitted his will, but he there was no one restraining him. Do you see? And we become self-imprisoned because of sin, because of thoughts, because of people, because of whatever in this world we've allowed to do that to imprison us when that's not the truth. And you need to experience that truth, not just know that truth. You need to experience that truth. Because Jesus said, you should tell this mountain to move and it'll, it'll obey you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ooh, I could do this all day. But I'm not. Because <laughs> I need to minister to some of you guys. Oh, this is good. Do you feel that? That that sense of peace and calmness and love and just all of those things God is. You you can you feel it. And it's and it's sweet. See, this is how we overcome the world, even our faith, right? Yeah. See, this is where my confidence comes from to talk to y'all, to minister, to prop. It's where it's com it comes from, this awareness of God I have, this relationship I have with him. Do you see? It doesn't come because I'm thinking I got to be, perform and be strong in front of y'all. No, it comes from my awareness of God. I'm very aware of him. Very aware of him. I'm very sensitive to him. Do you see? That's what we need. That's what Jesus had. The Bible says in the book of Luke that Jesus was teaching the power of God to heal was present. And then people started to receive healing. That's when they dropped the guy from the, the rooftop. But Jesus was aware of the presence, what was going on, what God was doing. Do you see? God loves y'all. Y'all think he's not, he's here. <laughs> but he wants to do it through you. He wants you to yield to you. He wants you to yield to him to release him. You see? And that's why we have to overcome and get over our mind and the flesh. 
or there will be no encounters for a lot of people who don't know what we know. So it's for others' benefits that you connect with God, not your own, for the benefits of others. Do you see? That's good. God is good. Thank you, Lord. To give that loved one over to him. Give that hardship over to Give that trauma. Give all of that over to him. And make it about you and him. Don't redefine his love for you based on what happened to you. Because he loves you. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, it's I who no longer live. But God that lives in me. And in the life I live in his body, I live now by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he went through a lot of suffering. But he had a great revelation of God's love for him. That's it. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all give God a hand of praise. <clears throat> All right. Woo, I just, I just, I just want to stay right here. <laughs> See, this is what I do most of the time.